So, so we're continuing to follow Jesus. So Jesus last week, seems like only last week that Jesus was going to the wedding. No, we spoke about it. But anyway, Jesus was at the wedding at Canaan with his mother and his disciples. And that's where he changed water, uh, changed water into wine. And, um, and they did those things. And we talked about the miraculous part about it. And then what the, you know, that the host of the party was amazed that, hey, we're, we've got the good wine at the end where most people serve the cheaper wine uh, at the end. And then Jesus, they left, they left um, Canaan and they went down to Capernaum, which would later become the head, well, it may have even been at that time the headquarters of Jesus, we don't know, but it later becomes their headquarters. And, um, and then it, all of a sudden Jesus shows up, this is in John chapter two, John shows up at the temple for one of the three fasts or one of the three festivals that all men had to go down, uh, had to go down to. And then we had the incident where they had the cleansing of the temple where Jesus is mad and, um, you know, overturned tables, whatever, you know, whatever he's doing. And he said, you know, you made my father's house, a, you know, a, a den of thieves and, uh, you know, and, and those things. And then he talked about, he said, you know, uh, that he was going to, you know, that the temple won't be left standing. And then they had that all controversy. I just want to bring that up to um, speed because when we go into chapter three, this is still right after the cleansing of the temple. So the first 15 verses of um, John three, he says, now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus sent to him, said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say to you, said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where the where it wishes, and you hear it sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one, <clears throat> except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believes in him may have eternal life. So, um, so that's the that's the beginning um, of that. So Nicodemus shows up. I, I don't, I'm I'm trying to abbreviate in my head, so I don't know how close I'm going to the notes. <laughs> so Nicodemus shows up after the cleansing of the temple in chapter two. And he comes to him at night, okay? And everybody always thinks, well, you know, Nicodemus is kind of a coward guy. You know, he comes at night. He doesn't want anybody seeing him there talking. You know, that, there's nothing in the text that, you know, that says that. You know, we just assume just over years of people, people saying that. You know, but it could be that their schedules were full. I think that they couldn't. You know, there wasn't time during the 
hectic part of the day or you know whatever it might be we we don't have anything that says that he came at night because he didn't want to you know want to be seen so um but anyway so what is he what is he asking overall what is he asking jesus about what does he start out with like in his first couple of words there what does he say he says um Rabbi, we know you are a teacher come from God, for no man can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. I mean, he's recognizing something in Jesus. I'm not quite sure about the timing of the signs, because I don't know the signs that Nicodemus would have seen at that point, because we pretty much, we have, now, we had the, um, we had the baptism, whether Nicodemus was aware of that, you know, where God said from heaven, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't. so I don't know the signs that he's seen, but he's seen something special in Jesus. Uh, Deacon Joe. Yeah, that uh, statement, Rabbi, we, plural, meaning he's not the only one. Yeah which means there may be others who have witnessed directly and shared that information with Nicodemus so that there's more than one miracle that's been witnessed, but by different uh, Pharisees. Yeah, you know, I mean, the word may have gotten out that Jesus turned the water into wine. I mean, that's way up in Cana. You know, that's, I mean, you got to remember, they don't have communication system. It's not like, you know, someone pulled out their phone and started texting you know, they're in Cana at a wedding. Oh, we would do this, wouldn't we? Something really great happens at a wedding that we're, you know, that we're at. Someone trip, drop the wedding cake. We're texting. We're putting it on Facebook. We're putting it on Facebook. And all of a sudden, everybody knows. That isn't the way it was back then. They didn't have that kind of communications. I mean, at all. I mean, it, we, we, we tried to figure out one time how far it was from Cana to Jerusalem because they went from Cana down to uh, went to Jerusalem and um, we don't know it's probably say 60 miles yeah so if it's 60 miles how long does it take to walk that if you walked at three miles an hour I think that's what the average gait is when you're walking if you I mean that's a pretty good step in it but if you're doing three miles an hour that's 20 hours so you're probably talking three days. I mean, you got to stop, rest, sleep, and, you know, find a McDonald's in the area or whatever. So you got something to eat like that. So that's the best somebody could do to get word down to Jerusalem. You won't believe what we saw this guy up there do. Have any of you ever heard of this guy, Jesus? And they go, well, he's turning over tables here now in, you know, at the temple. <laughs> So they could see so we don't know. We don't get enough of that kind of background in the you know in the stories. So we have to kind of you have to kind of imagine you know what's um what's happening. But he sees something, okay? He sees something in um you know in Jesus. And like Deacon Joe pointed out, he said, We know um that you're a teacher. That's funny, come from God. You know, so it's like, well, wait a minute. If I saw somebody doing magic tricks, I'm thinking this guy come from the devil. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, you, you don't you know because we're we're not we're not in tune like that. So um, anyway, that can't do this stuff unless. So Jesus answered him and said, "Truly, truly." Now this is in response to him. Okay. Nicodemus gives him a compliment, says, we know you're a man from God, God's with you. And Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That's like saying, what do you know? I mean, do you think you can see the kingdom of God? I mean, have you been, you know, have you been um, uh, born again? Would they even know what the born again is? Because that, then what's his name? Um, what's his name? Nicodemus said, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? 
That's a natural question. When somebody says, see, if we're so used to it. We have that Christian language for 2,000 years, okay? And so when somebody says, you must be born again, we pretty much know what they're talking about. You have to have some kind of a spiritual experience. These guys have no background, you know, in that. This guy is a leader in the, you know, in Jerusalem, and he's got no, he has no context, you know, with it. So he says, can a man enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you. Now, when, when Jesus says, truly, truly, that means I'm not lying here. <laughs> I mean, I have better terms for it, but I can't use them in Sunday class. But anyway, he said... <laughs> He goes, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Okay. So now what does that mean? I mean, these are things we have to think about. I think I have them in the questions down here on the uh, sheet, but I'm just trying to keep us up so we can finish this chapter this morning since we started late. But if somebody said to you that you must be born of the, um, you know, uh, born of water and the spirit. In fact, people still fight over that what it means to be born of the water and what it means to be born of the spirit, you know, like that. What does anybody think? I mean, if I, if I ask, go ahead. What's your name? I remember you guys were here last year. Okay. I mean, that goes with the, it goes with the born again and it goes, you know, it goes with the, you know, the washing of the spirit and stuff like that. Now, a lot of people today think that there's two baptisms. You know, you have the water baptism, and then you have the spirit baptism. You know, and the spirit baptism is the second blessing that the Christian gets after he's been saved and baptized, you know, however, whatever order you want to put him in. And it's at that time in that spirit baptism that you receive the you receive the Holy Spirit uh, is in a lot of in some churches it's evidenced by the speaking in tongues. So I only bring this up. This this isn't our belief, okay? Like that, some of you may have that belief, but it's not the Lutheran belief. But what it is is we believe there's one baptism, and at that one baptism you get salvation and you get the Spirit of God. You get the whole. You get the whole, yeah, you get the whole shebang. You get it, you get it all. Acts chapter two, around 38, somewhere around there, you know, it talks about, you know, go and be baptized, receive the Holy Spirit, receive the for, for the forgiveness of your sins, and to receive the Holy Spirit. So Peter's telling them at the uh, day of Pentecost to, to be baptized for the forgiveness of your sin. And to receive the Holy Spirit. So that comes at one time. So when he's talking about the, the water and the Spirit, he's talking about one, one baptism. But whatever he's saying, without it, he says you cannot see enter the, the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh and that which is born of the Spirit is Spirit. Do not marvel that I have said to you, you must be born again. I imagine by this time, Nicodemus' head spinning a little bit. He goes, I just wanted to know, are you from God? <laughs> you know, now you're talking to me. And I, can't, and I don't know that he, you know, that he, um, you know, that he knows. So when it, when he said there in five, I think, let me see, Jesus said, truly, truly, I say, unless you, one is born again with water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Why do we need an outside intervention? Why can't we just be saved by human intervention? You know, by um, you know, by our like by our own works or by the works of another another person. Pardon? Through him, right? But what I'm asking is, you know, why can't a man be saved by any human effort? Well, yeah, right. I got out an old note from an old Bible of mine. I probably wrote this in there 40 years ago, but I got man cannot be um, saved by any human effort because human effort can only produce human results. 
which makes sense. Human, well, yeah, you read my notes. I mean, my Bible. <laughs> Human results are sinful. Therefore, you must be born again. Anything that man does is sinful. You know, I, I'm not talking like breaking the Ten Commandments sinful. I'm just saying, if nothing else, falling short of the mark of God, okay, is sinful. Yeah, and that's what keeps you from, you know, from, um, you know, from being able to be saved like that. So, uh, let's see. Uh, do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. Now, this is a good one here. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Okay. So now what do you think Nicodemus is thinking? This guy's nuts. <laughs> yeah. You know, hey, you, you know, we laugh about that, but that's what most of the people thought about Jesus. I mean, not so much. I don't. I don't know if they questioned his sanity. They probably did, you know. But they, it was like this guy cannot be who he says he is, and the works that he's doing cannot be of God. You gotta remember, at the end result, they ended up by crucifying him. So. Um, Yes, it's like, see, because how many, we talked about this a long time ago. I don't even know what class we were in and stuff like that. Is how many questions were asked of Jesus? I don't have the answer right off the top of my head. How many questions were asked of Jesus that he answered them? I mean, that he gave him a direct answer. Very few of them. Jesus told them what he thought they needed to know not an answer to some, you know, when they say there's no stupid questions, I think Jesus thought a lot of these were stupid questions. So I'm going to answer what I'm, I'm going to answer in a way that I think that they need to know their question is really kind of, you know, irrelevant. So how sharp of a guy is, is Nicodemus? Pretty sharp. Huh? Pretty sharp. Said Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? He didn't say, you're nuts, I'm out of here. He, he wants to go further. I mean, he wants, he wants to discuss it further. You know, I think the whole thing with Nicodemus is he watched in the temple. He saw what was happening, what Jesus was doing. Now, we know that this stirred up a lot of the Pharisees. You know, Nicodemus, he's probably standing back going... I think there's probably more to this than what we, you know, than what we see. You know, there's something happening here. I'm going to go ask him. And again, like whether he went at night because he didn't want to be seen or he couldn't get an appointment, you know, he called Jesus' secretary and said, hey, I'd like to see the big guy. And they said, oh, man, he's busy all day. He, he's still out there overturning tables, you know, so you're going to have to you know, wait your turn, and but he gets together because he wants to know more, whereas everybody else might be upset. He's saying, tell me, what, were you going to say something, Ray? Yeah, my thoughts were that just like the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the, and the scribes were tracking John when Jesus came on the scene, I would have mad and said, we've got to, you know, somebody's now doing what John was doing. So we need to start tracking him, find out what he's about. And after he does a miracle, wait a minute, this guy poses a threat. He's got followers. Yeah. We need to keep a close eye on him and see what he's telling the people. Yeah. Yeah. And we'll see that at the end of chapter three. I don't know that we'll get there today. But at the end of chapter three, when John's out, you know, John's out baptizing and Jesus is out baptizing and the Pharisees want to stir up trouble between, you know, between them. Because you got to remember, John had disciples and was baptizing before Jesus was on, even on the scene, you know, like that. So, I mean, John is not, you know, John's a force for the, uh, the Pharisees to have to deal with. And then along comes this Jesus. And then at the end of chapter three, John's telling his disciples, no. Jesus is the man. I have to back off. Like that. And I think a couple of the disciples that Jesus had came from, you know, came from came from John. 
But here, here's a key verse. Here in verse 10, Jesus answered, and he says, and the wording here is important. Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? He used the definite article, the. Are you the teacher of Israel? Not, since you're a teacher here in Israel, he, he's saying, you, are you the teacher of Israel, and you don't know these things? The Greek words ho, in case you want to know, ho, 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 H-O, it's a, it's a little O with a little squiggly thing on top. Looks like a, like a beet, you know, growing in the ground. But it, but it, but he uses that definite article. You know, Nicodemus may be the man of the Pharisees. We don't know. Just Jesus' wording. You know, I mean, he may have been the top Pharisee. How would we know? We don't, you know, we don't know. Now, he may be the top Pharisee, and he may be a, you know, he becomes a follower of Jesus. He doesn't seem to be much of a vocal witness for Jesus because he's not out there, you know, preaching for Jesus. We don't know after the resurrection what became of him. We just know that he stood up once for Jesus in the um, Sanhedrin, I think it was, you know, and then he also um, helped uh, Joseph of Arimathea with the burial, uh, you know, of retrieving the body of Jesus and the burial. And we don't know much, don't know much about him, you know, after that. Any questions on any of that? Yeah. Okay. He says in verse, so he says, um, so, so he says, are you the teacher of Israel? Yet you do not understand these things. I'm wondering if Jesus, if there was an expectation, there probably was, that Jews should have known better. That Jews should have known that someone like Jesus anyway was going to be on the scene. And did they miss the signs? And they did, did, well, we know they missed the signs. They missed the signs. They missed how they were supposed to react to the signs. You know, they missed the whole, the whole thing. You know, here's the thing is that if you read the latter prophets, you know, Zechariah and some of those guys, some of those guys who were writing after the Babylonian captivity, when everybody was already in captivity, you were waiting to get out. Maybe even it was at the time that they started to get released. And all of those prophets were preaching about Jesus, you know? And they, they were they were pretty, I mean, obviously, you know, these prophetic writings are really cryptic. I mean, like that. But they were, and even Christians miss it today because they want to take all those writings of Zechariah and, you know, all those latter prophets, and they want to throw them out to Jesus' second coming. You know, to after now. <laughs> Instead of looking at it that that time they wrote was 500 years before Jesus would come and the temple would eventually be destroyed and all that. But these prophets were talking about that. And all that. But anyway, however it is, they missed it. And Jesus is recognizing that he that they missed it. And he said, truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. I think he's talking about, you know, him and the preaching of John. He says in verse 12, if I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? That makes sense. I mean, Earthly things, I mean, what's happening in our world? Those are hard enough to understand, you know? Okay. Why is Gen Z the way it is? You know? <laughs> I mean, no, no, but there's all kinds of things. We can't, and then to figure out spiritual things on top of that, that's hard. You know? So Jesus is recognizing that. He says um, in 13, verse 13, no one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Okay, so he's identifying himself with the Son of Man. Son of Man goes back to the book of Daniel. The Son of Man ascended on the clouds and met with the, um, the Ancient of Days, you know, um, you know, the throne of God in heaven, okay? 
here's this funny thing. I don't know if I brought this up before. The, you know, Jesus called Son of Man and Son of God. Which one's the more God statement? Son of Man or Son of God? Son of Man. Because Son of Man's identified with Daniel. You know? I mean, so when he identifies as the Son of Man, he's saying, I'm God. Okay. Son of God's not quite as, you know, a bold statement like that. So anyway, but that's off track. Um, and as, okay, 14. Uh, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whosoever believes in him may have eternal life. Who knows the story of Moses there? Hmm? Which one? Well, the, the one about the lifting up the Son of Man in verse 14, where it says, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Who knows that story? The, the snakes were biting. Right. If you right. wanted to survive, you had to look upon that uh, standard. Right. That was there. So Joe's got it. Is that out in the desert, because they were disobedient, Anybody ever think that the children of Israel were ever disobedient? <laughs> yeah, I know. So what happens is God sends snakes, sends snurp, snurpents, <laughs> serpents, <laughs> sends serpents to bite these people. And now they have, they've got that venom and they're dying. Okay? But what... God tells Moses to do is to build this, you know, make this stake, put the serpent on it, okay? And that whoever looks up at that stake will be healed from the bite. Anybody know what that stake with the serpent is? Medical symbol. Medical symbol. This is the impact that the Bible has on the world. People don't realize that they can deny it. They can say no effect. I don't believe any of it, you know, stuff like that. But all throughout everything, you see its impact and its effect. You know? So what he's saying is out there, if you looked upon it, you survived. What about the guy who said no? What about the people that say no to Jesus today? Yeah. What's their fate? They don't survive. And the same thing there. I'm sure that there was hard-headed people there, Who's this Moses guy to tell me how to be healed? Who's he to tell me what to do? Where does he come up with these superstitions? Okay. And, and you know, it's like in um, coming out of the out of uh, Egypt slavery, you know, when the angel of the Lord told him to put the blood on the doorpost, you know, you put the blood on the doorpost. And your family will be saved from the angel of death. I am sure that there was people who did not do that. Just because they're hard-headed, they, uh, they hate God, and they don't want to, to follow. And it makes you wonder, so how many Egyptians said, what can it hurt? And <laughs> seriously, and painted the doorposts and were saved. Because we know when they left Egypt, some Egyptian people went with them. They gave them all their jewelry and, you know, went with them. So uh, if God says to do something, especially if it's for your own physical and spiritual good, it's probably best to do it and see how it works out in the end, you know, later on. So the point is that he's saying is that, is Nicodemus, I'm telling you something like, you remember that story. You're a Pharisee. You're the leader of the you know, the Israelites and all that stuff. And I'm telling you, just like I know that you know that story, it's coming a day when Jesus, I mean, where Jesus, you know, where my father's going to build a cross and hang the Son of Man on that cross and people will be, you know, for the salvation of the people. Let me see. Wait, there was Joe, there was Dennis and um, Ray, I think. You know, it's just like the prophet when when he was asked to heal, said, go and wash yourself seven times. Yeah. And the guy's pride and, and personal, uh, I don't know, elevation was, that was demeaning. He, at least he felt it was. Yeah. So again, he questioned the same thing. Yeah. You know, 
Paul talks about this I'm going to, one of those Corinthian letters. <laughs> yeah. he, he talks about that. He talks about how God works in foolish ways, to you know, to, pardon? To, humble, to the humble the proud. I mean, things that people say, that can't be, you know? And like you say with um, Nahum, you know, at the river, I got cleaner waters in Syria than you guys have here in Israel. I'm not going to go dunk in your muddy old river like that. That that kind of pride, you know, jumps out at us. Dennis. Yeah, the, the, uh, we're coming up on celebration of Easter. We and, are. And, and people around the world, they, they celebrate. They, they don't have a clue what they're celebrating. But they do celebrate yeah. because of Jesus. Yeah. Resurrection Jesus. All over the world, they, they, no Christianity in their life still has, and yet they're still celebrating. Yeah, like that. No, and it, you, you always see it. You always see it. Christmas and Easter. Those people. It may be the biggest superstition they have in their life, but they show up because mm, you know what? I'm not going to risk not having blood on my doorpost. You know, type of you know type of thing. So. The movie, that movie of the green, uh, the green cloud coming uh, over the doors, missed the house. The blob. They did a good job of that. I think. <laughs> it, it didn't, didn't miss every door. Yeah. Even those that had it clear, but there were some who just didn't do it. Yeah. There were probably quite a few of the people, who yeah. the Egyptians who did. This, I think a lot of them believed yeah. that something was going on. If you remember the story of Jonah. You know, I don't know why this came to my head. You remember the story of Jonah? You know, Jonah's supposed to go out and preach to the um, Assyrians, to the Ninevites. And his message is, in 40 days, God's going to destroy you. That's his whole message. There's no, if you repent, you won't be destroyed. It's just, in 40 days, God's going to do it. Jonah doesn't want to do it. You know the story. Anyway, so... But the people get, so when he does end up in Nineveh and he walks to this three days journey to the center of town, preaches his, what is it? I think it's eight words, you know, mm -hmm. seriously. Yeah. I think it's like eight words that he preaches. Doesn't about face, heads out of town, goes, sits under the palm tree, whatever it was. Like that. And how did the Ninevites react? You know, they got into sackcloth and ashes, even though there's no promise of salvation. But they put sackcloth and ashes on all their animals also. I mean, you talk, I, I don't know if that's faith or what it is. Fear, maybe. I don't know. But they, they knew something was up. We're going to do the sackcloth and ashes. And I look at it like, I guess it doesn't matter if we survive, if all of our animals are dead, so we better, and they, anyway, they put sackcloth and ashes on all their, all their animals, you know? And so, again, that's where Jesus is when he's telling Nicodemus, like what happened with the serpents out in the desert, similar things going to happen. Now, Ray, you had your hand up when I started doing that. I don't know if you remember. Just the fact that... Even non-believers know John three sixteen. Yeah, but because they watch they football, they, 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 they can be cited, but they don't understand as right. to what the offering is. Right, right. That, and 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 that's the thing they don't they don't understand. You know, and people who remembers rock and rolling at the football games, the guy with the rainbow wig, and he had. You guys don't remember? They're going back in the seventies, rock and rolling. He had the big wig that he used to how he got into all these sporting events to where the main camera was he'd always be in the end zone at a football game he'd go to hockey games basketball games with his 316 sign you know and he was on tv oh, now rock and roll and is nuts he's in jail now i mean seriously he went nuts but anyway but uh who was it tim tebow yep. he used yeah. to wear his in his eye black he used to wear the john 316 yeah. and um I don't know how many people ever asked him, what the heck does that mean? You know, like that. But a lot of people know, a lot of people don't, but it's a good way to get, you know, something going. But yeah, you're right. That, that's how famous that verse is that people 
you know, people know that kind of um, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Now, what do you think John's purpose is, or Jesus's purpose is, for bringing up what happened out in the desert with Moses, and what's going to be happening? Uh, same thing. That just like a snake is raised, so is so Jesus had to be raised. And it wasn't the fact that, you know, that you look at it, you believe it is the The belief is what saved him. No. The thing is, I think, is I don't think that, because now we're going to come to John 3.16, okay? Like somebody read John 3.16 really loud into a microphone. You got to have it right there. Uh, okay. Good enough. So how are you going to understand John 3.16? You got to remember, this is the first time that John 3.16's said. Right. You know, I, like I say, millions of people have heard it over all the years. We've probably heard it a thousand times, each and every one of us. And you probably can't pick up too many Christian books that won't have that in. If not in the text, at least in a scripture reference in the you know, in the back. So we're all familiar with that. But think about these first century people that are hearing it. How are they going to know the impact of that good news of Jesus if they don't know what the bad news is? I mean, the bad news is, hey, you guys, you guys sinned, and I sent snakes after you. You know, snakes have a bad reputation in the Bible. You know? <laughs> but I sent snakes after you, and I saved you by the method that I wanted to save you from those, you know, from those snakes. And then Jesus says, you know, that, that that'll be him too. So then when he gets to John 3, 16, because remember, he's still talking, you know, and, and most of our Bibles probably make a header type of a, you know, break, you know, like this, you know, in the in the scripture where the editor puts a heading in like it's a separate something. But so if we go from 15, he says that whosoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting, everlasting life. So see, it goes from verse 14, 15, right into... 16. But I think Bible editors confuse. Does everybody have a break between 15 and 16 of some kind where it puts a title or something? Yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah. You know, and I, I think that they do damage by doing that, you know, to the to the text. You know, chapters and verses do damage to the text because every time you come to a new chapter, you think it's a new story. You know, and it's not necessarily so. It's one thing. Well, even like in John 3 from John 2. If John 2 ended, you know, ends with him cleansing the temple, and if um, and if Nicodemus is coming to Jesus because of that cleansing of the temple, it's all one look. Now, we wouldn't be able to find our way around the Bible without chapters and verses. Anybody here think they would be able to? Yeah. No. Yeah. Now they now the um, the people back in Jesus' day, well, especially like the old temple, a uh, temple. In the old times, when they had the um, scripture, you know, in in Luke, I think I think Luke four, when Jesus is at the synagogue and they bring him, it's his turn to read or something, and they bring him the scroll of Isaiah for the reading of the day. I'm sure that there was somebody in the synagogue who found it that passage in the scroll and brought it to the reader, you know, to, you know, to read. So he didn't have to open up a scroll that is, you know, I watched a video of the old synagogue that I used to go to when I was a kid and they, you know, they uh, make YouTube videos of their services, but they were doing the thing with, with the scroll and, uh, and the readings. And so at one end of the building, all the way around, the people got up and they held the scroll around the building. And then the, the rabbi went around. I thought this was pretty good. Okay. He went around and he would stop at each portion 
and talk about. It. I don't know if it was a scroll. I don't remember if it was a scroll of Isaiah or whatever scroll it was, but it was long, you know, like that. I mean, he would go around and do it. But you can imagine, so they hand Jesus a scroll, and it takes him 10 minutes to, you know, thumb through. So we're glad we have the we're glad we have the chapters and verses, but like I say, it could interrupt the flow of what's happening. Dennis. You know what? I happen to have one of yours. Peter said one of his versions has no verses in it. Really? Book. Yeah. Oh, right, right, right. right. Yeah. Got pretty cool. Pretty yeah. Cool. But it's hard to refer back to. Yeah. yeah. I like it, in fact, if you ever want to read the New Testament, um, like you're just reading, not like you're studying. Not like you're trying to find answers, but you just want to read. What you want to find, and they, there are some like this, is that they're just single column books. It'd be like the New Testament in a single column. Like you'd read any book. Who who picks up a book? Uh, who reads a, you had some book with you today. Yeah. A Mary Higgins Clark or something. Yeah. Who reads a James Patterson or something like that? And then each page is double columns. <laughs> He reads like that you know <laughs> except for the bible so if you ever want to read they do have them where they don't have the verses they have chapter numbers like that and it's just a you just read it and you can just sit back read it relax not feel like you're being challenged to study it so so you pick up that flow um and i think that's what the peterson book you know their their intent was yeah it's just to get it to get people to read and then you can go back and study or read more intently, but to at least pick up the thing. Right. And I got one more thing and then we'll stop. Well, isn't it the fact that uh, Luke and, and the book of Acts was all one continuous thing and it was so long that they kind of It may have been. I don't I I don't know that, but it but it may have been, you know, like that. And well, like I can say you know, chapter, I'm glad there's chapters and verses. You know, like that. I mean, you know, imagine imagine you're sitting there. Now, you got to remember, people don't, back in the days, in the Old Testament, they didn't have their own Bibles. They didn't have their own scrolls. Churches didn't even have the Bibles and the scrolls, necessarily. But if you showed up with your scroll and they go, you know, uh, turn to Numbers, you know, the part where, um, you know, Balak and Balaam, you know, or being discussed, which would be numbers 22, but you don't have 22 and you just have to scroll. You never, you never find it. So uh, one, one other thing I have. So we talk about who gets, who gets saved in 16. He said in 17, he says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. You know, that's a big deal. So many people think, that Christianity is a religion of condemning people. You know, first thing that you'll hear out of a lot of people's mouths, especially a lot of TV preachers, and that is that you better believe or you're going to hell. You know, like that. Now, see, that's okay for like me to say to a group like this is saying, yeah, people that don't believe are going to go to hell because you know we're. We're all in on it, and we've got the secret handshake and stuff like that. But to go, no, but to go out, like, like I always tease, when we're at IHOP, you know, for Masters Men, we've got our own room there, and there's a glass divider between us and the heathens who are eating pancakes. <laughs> <laughs> but if I were to, so I could say whatever I want to our group, but if I were to walk through that door into the main lobby and say, repent or you're all going to hell, Good way to win people. And also, a lot of those people, if we walked in and we said, hey, we're from Lamb of God Lutheran Church, we're having a Bible study. Anybody want to join us? Probably what's going to go through first in a lot of people's minds is the condemnation. You know, the, no, they're going to tell me how I'm condemned. But it says that he didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved. Here's the, this is the money verse. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he didn't believe in the name of the only son. We'll stop there. The point is, is that people are condemned. The whole world is condemned. Jesus, uh, Jesus, well, Jesus flooded the whole earth and wiped out everybody except for eight people. That's how condemned 
we are. So at the time of Jesus, that's how condemned the world is at that time too. And he's coming to rectify that. He's not doing it to condemn people. He's like, yes, Mary has an important message. Knowing that we all sin every day, you would be very shocked if somebody walked into your group and says, repent. I was at I was at, I was at Janet and I were down in Newport Beach in Southern California eating breakfast one day at a in an outdoor patio at a restaurant and some guy and he looked like he was somebody out of the um, Jesus movement in the seventies anyway and it had a little half wall around the patio and he jumped up on the half you know the wall and started I mean like he was um, Elijah or. You know, whatever. I got up and I went and I talked to him. I said, this isn't the time and the place to be doing this. I go, I got nothing against your message, but this isn't the you know way to do it. But you know, but people um people, well, we'll pick up, we'll pick up, we'll start at 316 and we'll move along a little bit, you know, as we go um next week. Uh, Diane, you have a prayer for us? Okay, let's do do the microphone. And say it loud. I'm going to come up the speaker here. Diane's got a verse for us. I mean, a, a prayer for us. Here, yeah, listen up. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Father, for sending Jesus to die for my sins. Thank you that his blood has paid for full penalty for my sins and that the power of sin in my life has been broken through him. Thank you that Christ has sacrificed Revealed his immense love for kindness and for me, mankind and for me. I just want to give you thanks and praise for the free gift of salvation that is open to whoever will come. For Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, not bad for something off the internet there. That was, that was good. What's that? What's that? What's that? Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. That's why. Yeah. Picky back on what the pastor talked about the BPM. I've been to the BPM. You're only like hours away. This is a regional BPM. Best If you have bought, you haven't lived. I am curious. If you have any interest in learning about anything, they give three, four hundred different breakout sessions on things you might want to learn to help your church grow. This is literally the best leaders from all the churches across the United States. They come and internationally come and give talks. And you can go online, pick and see what classes you might want to go to there are certain minutes. I'm telling you, if you have you're so close. When we travel to Grand Junction, I don't know. And I go with your girlfriend, you go with your husband, you go with one of your friends, they feed you all day, you will come back just on fire. You have got to take advantage of it. And there's a, a national 